Good morning and thank you for attending uh, this session on the pre-surgical evaluation of patients with epilepsy. And our first speaker is Professor Sam Berkovic from the University of Melbourne and Austin Health. And he's going to set the scene and give us an overview. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to Sam Bell and Jerry and the, and the organisers for inviting me. So um, our task this morning is to give you an overview of um, the impact and importance of imaging in the evaluation of people with focal epilepsy, um, and in particular for the um, issue of surgical treatment. Um, surgical treatment's not new. It began really in the, in the late 1930s and, and 1940s. Uh, initially was done in, re in relatively few centres, uh, essentially largely based on electrophysiological findings, EEG. But with the um, emergence of imaging, both structural and functional, imaging's become incredibly important uh, in this assessment. And what, I, what we hope to show you is the importance of a multidisciplinary evaluation of patients uh, with epilepsy. And uh, the three of us are going to give uh, some brief overviews and then we'll actually present some cases in, in really a comprehensive multidisciplinary format, much as we do every week, to give you a sense about how this works. You can use the mouse. Use the mouse? Nothing's clicking. I'm not advancing, sorry. Okay, we're, okay. so um, what, what I hope to convey to you is which patients are suitable for surgery, what's the role of the multidisciplinary evaluations, and what does the epileptologist uh, require from um, his or her uh, brain imaging colleagues. So just some big picture figures about epilepsy. It affects at least 3% of the population at some time in life. Um, it's not a condition that people walk around with a badge on, I've got asthma, or I've got diabetes. It's still got a lot of stigma, um, and particularly so in, the, uh, in, in, in our nearest neighbours in the Asian region, and that's something that we as professionals need to, to fight against. Um, biologically, it's divided up into two main types. Generalised, where the epileptic abnormality begins more or less simultaneously on both sides of the brain, and focal, where it begins, and it's more easy to understand, it begins focally or locally. These two types are fundamentally uh, different. They've got a different physiology. Each category has a number of major syndromes, and there are different etiologies, prognoses, and, and treatments, and the job of the epileptologist is not to diagnose epilepsy, but to diagnose the particular form of epilepsy that that patient has. And we'll be focusing on surgery for, for focal epilepsy. Focal epilepsy comprises about 60% of incident cases of epilepsy. About 70% of these are easily controlled on the first drug. Uh, and although we've had numerous new drugs, there remains a resistant 30% or so that remain incompletely controlled. And some of these cases are good candidates for, um, for epilepsy surgery. What's important is that epilepsy is not just uh, a problem of seizures. And I'm fond of showing this picture, which hangs in St Peter's Basilica. It, it shows the father in green bringing his epileptic son to Jesus to heal in what is a supplementary motor area seizure coming from the frontal lobes. And what this conveys to me is that epilepsy is not just a physical disease of the brain, it's a, it's a disease of the brain, the mind and the soul. And that's what we have to fix. These people are very troubled challenged people and uh, it's not just a matter of finding a focus and cutting it out, uh, it's a matter of dealing with, with all that. So there are many forms of uh, epilepsy surgery. The, the commonest, best known and best established is focal cortical resection where one attempts to remove the so-called focus. There are other types of epilepsy surgery that I've listed here but I won't be addressing these today. Some more adventurous types now with extracranial focus, radiotherapy or ultrasound or with the uh, uh, with uh, intracranial laser ablation, etc., but none of these have yet been shown to be superior to focal cortical resection, which we'll, which we'll focus on. Now, who is a surgical candidate? Well, first of all, we're, we're confining ourselves to focal epilepsy. They need to have refractory seizures for an established period. It, it's big surgery, it's got risks, there's a 1% 
um, risk of a major complication, so one doesn't do this as an early treatment. Traditionally, we said four years, but more recently, many people feel that if, if with adequate trials of therapy, people are not responsive after two years, they're destined to remain refractory, and the earlier you operate, the better. That's still a bit controversial, but some people would be operating within two years of, 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 of seizure refractoriness. You need to be on the right drugs in the right amount and appropriately monitored and with good compliance. And once you've tried three drugs, um, the benefit for the fourth, fifth or tenth drug becomes vanishingly small. So after three drugs, generally people are, are, um, are refractory. Uh, the epilepsy's got to interfere with the individual's life, and that's nearly always so. We want their general health to be good, and they've got to be well, well motivated. It's not the sort of procedure you take somebody to kicking and screaming. They've really got to want it. There are some special issues. Do, you, do we treat the very young and the very old? It's clear now that in the very young, the benefits are greater and um, the strategies there are different and I won't, won't be going into those. Traditionally, we didn't tend to operate on people older than 60, but we do now. People are all living longer and sometimes healthy, healthy ageing. Uh, and if they've got refractory epilepsy, it's worth considering. Similarly, we often excluded patients with intellectual disability. Um, from a biological point of view, they're more likely to have a more diffuse process. But if you can show that the, there's potential to resect the, um, the abnormal area and you'll improve their quality of life, even if they're in a group home or whatever, that's worthwhile as well. More challenging is the issue of psychiatric illness. Um, there is a clear-cut psychiatric comorbidity with epilepsy, which is interesting. It's not solely due to the fact that they've got a chronic illness, but it's probably biologically based. Uh, we see some people with epilepsy in quite severe um, neuropsychiatric illness and sometimes the, the driver for wanting surgery is to get rid of the psychiatric illness, sometimes from the family's point of view as much as the patient's, but that's not a good indication because the evidence that it helps those is less clear. So that's, a, that's still a complex area. We do operate on people with overt uh, or at least controlled psychosis, uh, but, it, but it remains a, a complex issue. Oh, OK, sorry. Nice might, yeah, it might be your hearing impairment, uh, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you can't hear... OK. So, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> Things haven't changed. But <laughs> so, if surgery works, why not do it on everybody? And epilepsy surgery was one of those things that uh, the believers said it would work and many non-believers just never sent their patients for it. Uh, and it's one of those things that's actually hard to do uh, to get class one evidence for, but there is class one evidence for epilepsy surgery that came out some time ago. A very clever study was done by Sam Weeb um, and um, they were able to show, uh, th this graph is a kaplan meier curve showing the percentage of patients that, that uh, remain um, seizure free after 12 months and divided into a surgical group and a group just treated with optimal medical care. And you can see there's a very significant difference. But the other point about this, uh, about this uh, graph is that only 58% of patients never had another seizure after surgery. So it's not a cure, um, but the patients are considerably benefited. And that figure of around 60% is, is, is the robust figure of groups that tell the truth. Um, and epilepsy surgery you know, doesn't always work, but it can work very well in some people and works superiorly to medical therapy in the appropriate patient. So there is class one evidence for it, but one still has to be very careful in, in, in the choice. Now, the next question is, what is the epileptic focus? Historically, we kind of thought that there was just a tiny area in the brain that was misbehaving, and if you'd get rid of it, everything would be fine. And that's, that's not true. It's a misleading concept of focus. There is a widespread epileptogenic region in, in, in patients with, it, with, uh, with epilepsy, and more, moreover, it undergoes plastic changes. Epilepsy, to some extent, is a progressive process with changes that we can see anatomically, with sprouting, with neurogenesis, and we can see molecular plasticity. There's a different molecular composition in and around the epileptic focus than there is in the healthy brain. Uh, and more than that, we're now thinking of uh, the, the epileptic process as a network phenomenon that doesn't simply involve a little area. And that network has neurophysiological consequences. There's a widespread electrophysiological abnormality and indeed may have cognitive consequences impairing the patient's memory or other, other factors. So it's not just a tiny little area that you have to find. 
And the critical area question we want to answer is what area must be removed to effect seizure freedom? And we still don't have the perfect test that answers that, but all our investigations are trying to do this. This slide just gives you um, a, is a cartoon of what, what happens with chronic epilepsy, that often there's an initiating event. There are modulators. Uh, epilepsy doesn't start immediately. You all know that after a head injury or stroke, if there's chronic epilepsy, it typically begins after a period of months or years, not right away. So it, it, is, a, it, it is a dynamic process. Uh, and then the epilepsy itself begets functional changes, which we believe leads to chronicity. So we, we are desperately looking for, pre, uh, for drugs and other procedures that will stop this uh, vicious uh, cycle and interrupt the process of epileptogenesis. But although this can be shown in experimental animals, we still don't have that in, in, in man. So th there have been some paradigm shifts in thinking about epilepsy surgery. Way back before um, imaging and before proper clinical classification, people had seizures. If they had a focal EEG abnormality, they may have had epilepsy surgery, but the results were not too good. But we now think about the treatable epilepsies, particular syndromes that are based on the clinical EEG and imaging classification that can be treated. Imaging's had an enormous impact, as, as, we'll, as we'll show. Um, and there was a famous sort of quote uh, years ago, um, early in the imaging era, um, which was, um, how many tests do you need, or how many tests do you need to, or when do you go ahead and do epilepsy surgery? And the answer was, when all the ducks line up in a row, like a shooting gallery, when everything kind of matched. Now, we still do that. The trouble is we've got so many tests now, um, it's not pragmatic to do everything. Um, and that's one of, the, one of the practical problems. So different centres rely on different techniques. Uh, you'll see very good centres approaching the problem in somewhat different ways. Um, there, are not, there are no good studies comparing sort of best practice uh, in terms of, of, of the science. And there's also the issue of economic rationalism. One can't afford to do absolutely every test on everybody, even in the developed world, much less in the, in the developing world. And there are some very effective epilepsy surgery programs in countries that are not that wealthy but manage to do it with good... Um, uh, with uh, good clinical input uh, and the basics of electrophysiology and imaging. There are dangers with a sort of new paradigm that technology can make it sort of apparently so simple that you see something on an imaging test and you recommend uh, surgery uh, and it really what we hope will emphasise here that it remains a multidisciplinary process. No one individual has all the skills to, de to decide on this uh, and it's a danger for the occasional operator. So a quick run through of the tests that we have. Electrophysiology, EEG in all its guises is still very, very important. The interictal EEG, that's the recording of the brain uh, between seizures, uh, is helpful, but unfortunately it gives you in many ways too much information. There's often um, epileptiform activity in more than one spot, which does not necessarily mean that it's a multifocal process. There's often slow wave activity. Uh, and although it is a, a good general guide, we no longer use that as a strong guide where to operate. Um, the important thing is to record seizures, uh, which is usually done just with surface electrodes in, in video monitoring suites. Uh, and this gives us good information about where the seizure is coming from. And sometimes we go ahead and do intracranial recording, which is technically much more elegant, but only samples a relatively small part of the brain, is invasive with a morbidity, so it's not something one, one, uh, one, one wants to rush into. Uh, then there are a whole suite of uh, MR techniques. MR structural imaging is the core, and Dr Fit will outline that for us. But there are also a whole lot of advanced MR technologies, including spectroscopy, tractography, a whole variety of connectivity uh, measures, which, again, some groups are using, but the structural imaging remains the bedrock of this. Then we have a functional imaging, which... Um, is particularly FDG PET, which Dr Berlingeri will address. There are other ligands that have been used in PET imaging for localisation, particularly for flumazenil. None of these have sort of become standard in many centres, although certain centres will rely on particular isotopes that they've got the ability to produce and the expertise to interpret. And SPECT imaging uh, is something that we rely on uh, very heavily. Uh, 
Professor Rose started off with this early in his career in, in our unit and really uh, showed how valuable uh, this was many, many years ago. We continue to use ictal spec. The, the trouble with ictal spec is the logistics of getting it organised that the patients need to be injected with the radioisotope uh, on the ward at the time of the seizure and the, and the timing of this has to be accurately measured. So again, this, this requires teamwork uh, between the nurses, the, the doctors in the, in the epilepsy ward and the nuclear medicine team. Uh, and in institutions where that's well set up, it really works beautifully. And then importantly, we need to figure out how other bits of the brain work, particularly neuropsychology. Memory is a very big issue in patients with epilepsy, and one needs to have expert neuropsychologists who really understand the organisation of memory and the likelihood of surgery impacting that. And, and finally, neuropsychiatry, a real in-depth assessment of the psychiatric comorbidities and the likely impact on the patients. So what we look for, and we hope we'll show you in, in the sort of um, mock um, uh, cases that we're, well, they're not mock, they're real cases, but we're doing it in an abbreviated form. The congruence of the data is essential before one makes that big decision for surgery. So what do we want to know? We want to know what the location and extent of the epileptic uh, zones are. Uh, and here, structural and functional imaging uh, data are essential. It doesn't tell us, nothing actually tells us the limit of the epileptogenic zone, but we at least know about the core and it's extremely helpful. Um, we also want to know, can it be removed safely? Uh, and this is something that we rely on, particularly the um, imaging to show us the borders of where we'd like to resect and the, and the um, experience of the neuropsychologist to tell us what the likely impact is, having looked at the baseline neuropsychological function of this patient and what's the likelihood of a, of a surgical removal um, affecting that further. And again, you really need a skilled team to help you with that. And will the patient have a better quality of life? And that's tough, but again, one relies on one's psychiatry and psychology colleagues to really get a deep understanding of how this patient ticks uh, and whether this will work. Um, one of the big um, surprises of this, of this field is that you can have a medical success but a psychosocial disaster um, in the sense, as I mentioned before, from that picture um, of the, of the, uh, of the um, uh, uh, Raphael's picture of the transfiguration. Uh, the psychological side is really important. The patients may have unfulfilled expectations. They can have, this, even if their seizures are gone, they can have the so-called burden of, of normality. They can actually have a sense of guilt that the seizures have gone. It sounds bizarre when you first hear it, but what happens is that their lives and their lives of their families and their partners uh, are enmeshed with the epilepsy. And when the epilepsy is gone, it's actually not that great. Um, and you need to anticipate this and help them through it. And we have a very active uh, counselling uh, service, both preoperatively and postoperatively, to minimise that, which is uh, what we believe we do. So um, with that preamble, uh, we're going to hear now about the details of the imaging. Can we go on with that? Or? Yep. yep. Good. Uh, thank you, Sam. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Greg Fitt from Austin Health Radiology to give us the MRI aspects. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank uh, Sam Belangeri and the organising committee for the uh, opportunity to uh, present to you uh, this morning. Uh, so I'll be talking about MRI and focal epilepsy. Um, and. Uh, Hopefully I'll demonstrate to you some aspects of an optimised uh, MR technique uh, in epilepsy and how this uh, differs from when we're targeting other pathologies. Um, I'll uh, illustrate the appearance of common uh, and some not so common uh, pathologies that cause epilepsy and in particular focus on uh, those that are surgical targets. Uh, I'll raise the issue of a second look MR. It's not uncommon that an MR initially is reported normal and I'll show you a couple of cases. Uh, and then after a multidisciplinary approach, uh, a subtle lesion is found. And uh, towards the end, I'll just show a few of uh, the more advanced uh, and additional MR techniques to our usual protocol. Now, Sam's already co covered this. I wanted to point out that uh, optimal management of epilepsy is definitely a team sport um, with mu uh, expertise from a range of disciplines, uh, but uh, imaging uh, plays an important role. 
Um, so in generalized epilepsy, which we're not talking about, MR uh, is less useful. And uh, it's really in focal epilepsy uh, where patients, as has been discussed, a minority but a substantial group respond poorly to medication. The seizure severity is such that they will consider and, and in fact, often demand uh, surgery uh, on their brain to improve their, their lot. Um, uh, it, in focal epilepsy, uh, an MR lesion is relatively common, and we know that uh, there, is, there are good results with surgical resection of an MR visible lesion. So optimised uh, technique uh, in epilepsy is where I'll uh, proceed to now. And this really was the beginning. This is a study by Jackson, and uh, our previous speaker was one of the co-authors. This is uh, back in 1990 on a low field uh, MR magnet. You can see this very grainy image taken from their paper. But even on this very low field image, we can see that the uh, right hippocampus is a little brighter than the left. Uh, this was the start uh, of uh, MR uh, Im uh, and uh, epilepsy uh, imaging. Uh, and really introduced, this paper introduced hippocampal sclerosis uh, to the radiology community. So I'd like to just go through this brief case to illustrate the importance uh, of an optimised technique. So this is a young woman with long-standing intractable seizures, uh, suspicious uh, of left temporal onset, uh, she, and the MRI shows a normal right hippocampus and an atrophic small abnormal signal on the left. Uh, an abnormal signal on T1 as well. She had a temporal lobectomy and was seizure-free. So a simple but powerful uh, case uh, history. Uh, hippocampal sclerosis historically has been the most common pathology resected. If we're going to optimally image for epilepsy, we need to assess the hippocampus well. And I'll draw your attention to this sagittal image on which we see the hippocampus, and it's the particular orientation of the hippocampus which informs the choices we make uh, regarding optimal uh, imaging in epilepsy. So this slice here is in, taken in a conventional plane, uh, with a non-epilepsy directed plane, and we can see the head of the hippocampus, but we only see a short section of it. So it's in this plane here, and this is roughly the plane that uh, traditional MR and also CT is acquired and, uh, and standard uh, uh, acquired and, and viewed. And you'll notice that this imaging plane is at about 45 degrees to the hippocampus. So this is absolutely the wrong angle because uh, to assess the hippocampus because at 45 degrees you're maximising partial volume averaging. So this is a, uh, making it uh, difficult to assess not only the hippocampal volume but hippocampal signal because of partial volume averaging. So in their paper in 1990, uh, Graham and uh, Sam and others uh, proposed that if we're going to optimally assess the hippocampus, we need to be in the hippocampal plane. And here we see the head and body of hippocampus in the plane. But even more important than that, we need to look at the hippocampus in short axis, perpendicular to the hippocampus, to minimise partial volume averaging. And this is a, uh, an example of our optimised epilepsy technique at high field, preferably um, with multi-channel head coil, and whole brain is important. We see studies from external institutions where the whole brain is not imaged, uh, and you know, that's, a, that's a critical error. So we have whole brain imaging at high resolution, 3D acquisition in T1 and a water-sensitive water sequence, in this case a flare. We can use double inversion recovery as an alternative. And these are done in several clinical indications, but important in epilepsy. And these three here, when you see these, you essentially know you're looking at an epilepsy study. These are coronal proton density, T2, and an inversion recovery, T1-weighted image, targeting particularly the hippocampi. And we do a couple of other sequences as well. So for the next part of the talk, I'd like to illustrate some of the, uh, the common uh, and perhaps not so common uh, causes of epilepsy that we see on MR. And I've organised this in a bit of an eclectic uh, fashion for this particular audience with, with a focus on some lesions that are uh, subtle and easily missed in some cases where functional imaging can play an important role. So firstly, the hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, another paper by Graham Jackson in 93 uh, documented the cardinal features of hippocampal sclerosis, which I'll show here. So on the right, we see the normal hippocampus. On the left, we see the hippocampus is small. 
and the signal is bright. You can see the hippocampus here is brighter than the other side and brighter than the adjacent grey matter. So we have atrophy and high signal and we have low T1 signal. We have loss of internal structure and I've just magnified this to show the internal structure, the sort of semi-Swiss roll appearance of a normal hippocampus. So we can have right hippocampal sclerosis with a normal left, we can have left hippocampus with a normal right, we can have subtle hippocampal sclerosis making it difficult, a little bit of shape asymmetry, there's mild atrophy and mild signal abnormality. A particularly difficult case is where we've got bilateral hippocampal sclerosis, so we don't have a normal contralateral side for comparison. This is a fairly obvious case because it's quite severe bilaterally. There are different patterns. Hippocampal sclerosis can be a solitary finding with a normal brain elsewhere. It can be associated with hemiatrophy, as in this case with hippocampal sclerosis on the same side. And it can also be associated with a discrete second lesion, a second potentially epileptogenic lesion. And in the epilepsy world, this is called dual pathology. So that's important. We've now got a patient with two lesions, hippocampal sclerosis, and in this case, polymicrogyria, two lesions which may cause their epilepsy. So an important role for clinical correlation and for functional imaging to inform us about the relative importance of resecting one or both of these pathologies. So with, um, uh, and I think I've alluded to that, so I'll move on. So I'll talk now about, I'll demonstrate some of the major cerebral malformations that cause epilepsy. So this is a case on the left of tuberous sclerosis with multiple discrete uh, cortical tubers, many of which have a tapering uh, towards the lateral ventricle. So this is a case also where there are potentially multiple epileptogenic foci. In a small percentage of TS pa patients with tuberous sclerosis, it appears clinically that perhaps one of these is dominant and may be a surgical target. And there, in this, uh, this is also a setting where functional imaging can be critically important to tell us if perhaps one of these is the dominant cause of the patient's seizures. Polymicrogyria is another malformation that's commonly associated with seizures. On the left and posteriorly, we have the normal gyral pattern, and on the uh, patient's right, on our left on the screen, multiple little short radius uh, turns that represent the poly region of polymicrogyria. And on this sagittal image, the normal uh, gyral pattern here and polymicrogyria here. And on the left, we've got an example of schizing carefully. So this is a characterised by a cleft from the convexity through to the ventricular system. In this case, it's a closed lip, but in some cases, the cleft is very wide. We know that this is developmental, that is, very early onset, uh, because it is lined by abnormal grey matter, which is actually polymicrogyria. Some other malformations. Here we have a case of band heterotopia. So this is grey matter that has migrated from the germinal matrix out towards the cortex, but hasn't reached the cortex, so it's halted along the way, in this case in a laminar or band formation. And this, uh, are two, these are two different cases of an alternative uh, type of heterotopia, in this case periventricular nodular heterotopia. So we've got some normal grey matter here, this is the hippocampus, but there should not be grey matter out here. So this is a heterotopian, and in fact, this patient has multiple heterotopia, and this patient as well. So this is normal chordate nucleus, but there should not be grey matter here, so another heterotopian. And here's another, uh, another pathology. This is a patient with Sturge-Weber uh, syndrome, where there is usually unilateral uh, atrophy, uh, often posteriorly, associated with cortical calcification, which we can see as low T2 uh, on that image, and uh, typically has some leptomeningeal abnormal leptomeningeal enhancement. Uh, so this is, again, a, 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 a condition that is strongly associated with epilepsy. Uh, there are also uh, many focal developmental uh, lesions. And I'll show a couple of neoplasms. So these are two developmental neoplasms. In this case, a ganglioglioma, fairly nondescript on the axial flare image, but the sagittal T1 way to the image shows that this is a very discrete image. It's got some subtle mass effect and this is a neoplastic process, in this case a ganglioglioma. There's actually a lot of imaging overlap between these two, although the two cases I'm showing are very different. This is a very characteristic bubbly appearance, a well-defined heterogeneous uh, lesion on T2 with, I'm not sure it's projecting well, but a, a nodule of enhancement. Characteristic appearance for a DNET. This is a 
condition that has characteristic seizure type, uh, gelastic or laughing seizures. And uh, if we're given that history, we will look carefully in this region for uh, some tissue, a rounded nodule in this case, similar in uh, signal to grey matter. So this is a little something we need to be careful of as radiologists because we're usually looking at the cortex for epileptogenic lesions, but this is an example of something that's deep within the parenchyma and yet epileptogenic. On the right, I've got an example of a cavernoma, one of the vascular malformations that can be associated with epilepsy. I'll leave these for a moment uh, and come back to those uh, as uh, particularly interesting uh, topics for us. And just mention briefly that there are many acquired conditions that can cause epilepsy as well. We've seen hippocampal sclerosis. The most common cause of epilepsy worldwide is, is this, uh, neurocysticycosis. And this is a classic example with multiple different stages of the disease. We, we, here we have the vesicular stage, and within that cyst you can see the filling defect of, which represents the parasite. And here we have uh, some edema around a dying cyst, and there are multiple low signal uh, foci that uh, represent a calcified chronic uh, neurocysticycosis. Uh, on the, the far right, we have an example of post-traumatic uh, injury, uh, which, which may be epileptogenic and may serve as a surgical uh, target. So I'd like to talk about these two uh, uh, processes because although in this case it's very obvious, uh, there are many cases where these are subtle and, uh, and we often as MR radiologists need the help of our clinicians to tell us where to look and our functional imaging colleagues to also tell us that we should be looking in a particular part of the brain. So this is focal cortical dysplasia type 1 characterised by cortical thickening and blurring of the grey-white matter junction. Compare this large region, which is all abnormal, with the normal appearance laterally and on the other side where there is good grey-white matter differentiation and normal thickness. Now, some areas look thickened. That's partial that's part volume averaging. And as we scroll, scroll through to adjacent slices, we can identify that this is actually just normal. But this was on multiple adjacent images and, and clearly abnormal. And one of the, the other major categories, focal cortical dysplasia type 2, it has the same features as, as type 1, but also a couple of other features. Here we see one of them, the subcortical high signal that is characteristic of balloon cell dysplasia. And as well as that, we see a transmantle band heading down to the ventricle uh, in many of these cases. So when we've got a subtle lesion, we're not sure uh, we can find something, we need to look for one of those two signs. And in this case, we have uh, some subtle high signal at the grey-white matter junction. Compare that to the normal grey-white matter junction in this region here. So here we've got some high signal telling us that this is almost certainly a balloon cell dysplasia. And the other finding that we need to look for is a subtle transmantle band. And when we find that, we can again look at the overlying cortex and say, yeah, we're pretty convinced this is abnormal. We need to distinguish that from other uh, linear structures that are normal, such as perivascular spaces, and on occasion that can be challenging. This is a focal cortical dysplasia that was difficult to find, but we were led by the clinical story uh, of uh, epilepsy involving the right arm. And uh, this was actually resected and a, a proven focal cortical dysplasia. The other lesion which is usually subtle is an encephalocele. And we've seen more and more of these as we've become accustomed to looking for them uh, in recent years. And um, I'm not sure that this is how well it's going to project, but there is a subtle contour ab asymmetry. Uh, and the question is whether that's anatomic variation or whether it's abnormal. And in this case, we did a CT to show that there is uh, erosion of the inner table. Here's the inner table of the vault, and here it is here on the normal side. And here we have this abnormality, which is the brain herniating into the bone in this encephalocele. Here's an interesting case that presented to our institution after a right temporal uh, lobectomy elsewhere with ongoing seizures, and the question was, maybe it's coming from the left. In 2007, we reported this as normal. In 2017, with better image quality at 3T, we were suspicious that there's something wrong here. We got the patient back a third time, and, uh, and here we can see on this very high-resolution directed image that there is indeed parenchymal tissue, cerebral tissue, extending into this defect, a proven encephalocele. And this is from the operation care of our uh, neurosurgeon showing in this patient multiple small little encephalocele's uh, that were resected. So a few minutes then on some...
advanced techniques and some additional techniques on top of our routine uh, imaging. So uh, this is uh, imaging in a patient with a standard um, head coil, uh, eight channel head coil, I think that was. And here we've got that we, we were suspicious of abnormality here, so we got the patient back with surface coils which are placed at the side of the head and give very good signal to noise immediately under the surface coil. And I hope you can see that there is this linear band here. In fact, this was another case of band heterotopia. An alternate to surface coils are the newer um, uh, multi-channel head coils which give us improved signal to noise throughout the brain. And an alternative approach to improving SNR, an additional approach rather, is increasing uh, um, field strength. So I hope, it's difficult on projected images perhaps, but I hope I can demonstrate to you that the grey-white matter junction sharpness is improved at the higher field strength. Now it's affected by other things as well, how the sequence is done, the patient movement, but generally there is uh, substantially improved signal to noise uh, at higher field. If we go to higher field again, so it's 7T, now there aren't too many clinical scans at 7T, this is essentially still a research tool, there are substantial um, safety and physiological issues to be overcome at, at this field uh, strength, but we get uh, much improved. This is uh, not in vitro, this is uh, ex vivo, uh, but showing the, the sort of detail that can be obtained uh, at, uh, at high field. There's been a recent publication showing that in fact this does, as we would expect, improve detection of subtle lesions because of the improved signal to noise obtained. And this is uh, well beyond anything that's in the clinical realm. This is also uh, ex vivo, so in a very small uh, volume, um, but very high field machine with 14 hours of imaging, so clearly nothing like the clinical field, but we can see the amazing resolution obtained when we go to these extremes. I'll mention briefly functional MR. So functional MR is basically a subtraction technique. It's assessing focal changes in cerebral blood flow that occur with focal changes in uh, brain function and activity. And it can be used in a number of ways. Uh, in the setting of epilepsy. Sam's alluded already to the fact that we can use this to identify eloquent parts of the cortex, in this particular example, the uh, primary motor strip. It can also be done to assess connectivity in and around uh, lesions. And so we can develop connectivity maps uh, that might explain why, why a seizure, in, which seems to be arising in one part of the brain, is due to a lesion in another part of the brain. And in very selected cases, uh, we can um, identify seizure, seizure origin, and this requires uh, EEG, fMRI. So this is a, an example of uh, an image of uh, an MR machine, and in this we have these electrical wires, EEG wires. So this is uh, you know, a, a great technological achievement to acquire this, to achieve this safely and reliably, because putting any metal into an MR machine has got some safety concerns. And here we're putting in not only metal, but we're putting in conductors. And potentially, if this is not done correctly, there is a risk of inducing electrical currents. So we have risk of burning patients and a risk of killing them with electrical currents. Uh, so this is you know, not a trivial undertaking. As well as that, we've got rapidly changing magnetic field gradients that potentially could severely mess around with what are very subtle electrical signatures from EEG. So a, a pretty impressive uh, technological achievement here. And what this does is it gives us timing information, remembering that fMRI is a subtraction technique. So what this is telling us is this is the period of time when the seizure is occurring and this is the downtime. So now we know which bits to subtract from which to optimise assessment of uh, fMRI signal. And, um, and this is, uh, it can be used in very selected ca case, um, cases. Patients don't usually uh, tolerate much more than an hour in the scanner, so they need to be quite active, and they need to have the sort of, so frequent seizures, but they need to have the sort of seizures that they're not going to damage themselves when they're in the deep dark MRI tunnel. But this is an example of such a selected case where um, we have focal blood flow changes reflecting focal brain activity at the time of seizure onset. I'll show just a couple of other techniques. There are various uh, techniques for uh, reformatting our volumetric data to uh, better display subtle changes of gyration. Um, and a couple of just last comments about quantitation. So 
This is a technique that's not really new. It's been done for many years. It's quite manually labor intensive and requires um, you know, some expertise to draw regions of interest around the hippocampus or multiple slices. And there have been a number of attempts to try and automate this with, um, you know, with improving success. But um, this is a way of quantitating, in this case, hippocampal atrophy uh, when it's in situations particularly where it's uh, visually difficult or, or in, in the setting of uh, clinical research. And another uh, approach to quantitation is to quantitate signal. And this is a, an exam these are examples of uh, T2 maps. So usually we're talking about a T2 weighted image. So that's a T2 weighted image, but it also has T1 weighting and proton density and susceptibility and diffusion and, and a few other things as well. What this is doing is getting rid of those other things and just assessing the T2 relaxation, which is a physical property of matter. And we do this by doing a T2 weighted image and measuring the signal at different time points, generating this curve. And from that curve, we can create a, uh, a T2 map where the signal is re related directly to the T2 relaxation. And there are very tight, uh, normal, is a very tight normal range for hippocampi, for example. And when it's outside that range, it's good evidence that the hippocampi are abnormal. So in conclusion, I I've, uh, hope I've uh, illustrated the, some of the aspects of uh, targeted um, uh, epilepsy imaging. Uh, epileptic genic lesions indeed do have characteristic appearances. That's important, particularly when they're subtle. Uh, interpretation of MR ideally should be in the setting of clinical features and functional imaging, particularly when uh, MR is uh, negative initially, uh, or thought to be negative initially. And uh, advanced MR techniques can be used in selected cases. Thanks for your attention. So our third speaker is Dr. Sam Berlingeri from Austin Health, and he's talking to us about the molecular imaging aspects. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, welcome to everyone. All right, so I'll be speaking on uh, SPECT and PET and epilepsy. So the objectives of um, my presentation are firstly to understand the role of SPECT and PET in the pre-surgical workup of patients with focal epilepsy. Two, to recognise ictal SPECT blood flow patterns in temporal and extratemporal focal epilepsy. And three, to recognise FDG PET metabolic abnormalities in patients with focal epilepsy. All right, here we go. Um, we've got a uh, Japanese word here. It's made up of um, two kanji, the kanji for think and the kanji for way. And, as, and, and just as in imaging, um, a graphic here can express a very complex um, idea and uh, thinking. So what we need in uh, functional imaging is a way to conceptualise the epileptic focus. And the epileptic genic zone is one such conceptual construct. And the, the epileptic zone, as um, Sam had alluded to earlier, is um, a, quite a large region. It may well, it encompasses a number of different areas. It encompasses the seizure onset zone, which we can define using ictal spect. Uh, it also encompasses the leptogenic lesion, usually a structural lesion that we can image on MRI. There is a symptomatic zone, which is the area of EEG abnormality on video EEG. And then there is the functional deficit zone, uh, which usually is, encompasses all of these areas and is the larger of the zones. And we can define that on interrectal PET. We do run into difficulties, however, when um, these areas are, sorry, are discordant. So the areas don't line up, and often these patients do poorly. And we also encounter the situation where patients may have multiple foci. Um, and again, um, the challenge here is to identify these individuals and uh, to determine whether they remain surgical candidates. Uh, 
So the evaluation of patients with refractory epilepsy determines whether a single epileptogenic zone is responsible for the seizure disorder. And the epileptogenic zone includes the cortex generating the seizures, which needs to be removed to render the patient seizure free. So epilepsy surgery has the best results if the different cortical zones are concordant, with surgery rendering somewhere between 60 and 90% of patients with unilateral temporal lobe epilepsy and up to 70% of patients with a, a focal cortical malformation seizure-free. Um, ictal spect, as you've heard, is uh, an inpatient procedure. Usually the patient uh, will be uh, weaned off their medication. They're um, monitored using video EEG. We, um, in, in imaging, we'd like to differentiate between temporal epilepsy and extratemporal epilepsy. And the reason is that these um, seizure types have different um, time resolution. So in the case of the perfusion changes in uh, temporal epilepsy, uh, the interictal state shows typically an area of hypoperfusion. Patient will have a seizure. There'll be a marked increase in blood flow. And then there is a progress progressive return to the baseline with a time resolution occurring in minutes. So over a period of two to four minutes, um, we can capture the ictal event, and then the patient slowly returns to baseline. In this example, um, patient uh, at time zero um, has seizure onset at seven seconds, and then the injection is given at 41 seconds, but by this time there's spread propagation of the seizure to the contralateral side, and the seizure is terminated. So it's essential that we have temporal um, information about the progression of the seizure event so that we understand exactly when the uh, images, the, when, the Im when the dose was injected and when, we were, when we've captured the event. So we've captured this event in the early ictal phase, but at a time when there's been spread to the contralateral temporal lobe. And you can see on this study, this is a, a very early image from the 90s, so I apologise for the resolution, but it, it does show you that um, on the interrectal spec there is reduced perfusion on the left, and then on the ictal study um, we have increased perfusion on the right, but by this time there had been spread to the contralateral temporal lobe. The interrectal FDG PET, however, uh, demonstrates co correct lateralization with hypometabolism on the left. The perfusion changes in extratemporal lobe epilepsy are much more complex. Uh, this is really not for the faint-hearted. So in the interrectal study, we may or may not see an area of hypoperfusion. During the ictal event, uh, there'll be increased perfusion arising in that epileptogenic zone. Um, can I just point out that the time resolution here is measured in seconds. So it, now we're already at 10 seconds here. So uh, by the time the ECD or the HMPO is injected and you allow 10 to 15 seconds for it to reach the brain, you're well into the uh, late ictal or early post-ictal phase. There may be spread to multiple regions during the uh, seizure propagation. So you may see multiple areas of increased perfusion. And then in the postictal phase, um, there may be multiple areas of relative hypoperfusion as the patient returns to baseline. So this is actually a um, excellent illustration of what um, can happen depending on the timing of the injection during, uh, during a seizure. So this is a patient uh, with um, occipital epilepsy on the left, 
The interictal shows bilateral temporal hypoperfusion. Uh, fortuitously, we happen to capture early, mid, and late ictal studies. And you can see on the early ictal that there is a, a focal area of increased perfusion uh, localising to the epileptogenic lesion or zone region um, with some increased, uh, increased blood flow occurring particularly on the left in, at this time point. And as we move later through the uh, seizure uh, propagation, we can see that uh, there is relative hypoperfusion posteriorly. The ictal focus remains, but uh, now we're seeing increased blood flow in both temporal lobes. So someone can, you can easily be misled to thinking that this might be a bilateral temporal seizure were it not for the fact that um, the patient's clinical uh, presentation suggested something po occurring posteriorly in the posterior quadrant on the left. And then on the late ictal, the um, seizure focus has returned almost back to, to baseline. There's still some relative hypoperfusion and we're still seeing some increased blood flow on, in the temporal lobes. So this case is an excellent illustration of the difficulty that we encounter um, when trying to interpret ictal events, and it's crucial that we have that temporal information. Another example of ictal spec, uh, in this case, a uh, focal area of increased perfusion in the right parietal lobe and a dysplastic lesion again on the right. And this case really illustrate, is here to illustrate the process that um, patients undertake or the, in terms of imaging to, 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 that leads to surgery. So we have registered the SPECT with the MR. The patient has gone to, uh, M, to have a, a, a stereotactic MR and then... Um, Using the stereotactic system, the lesion is localised. The patient is in a stereotactic frame and uh, they've undergone surgery. Uh, I'll turn uh, your attention to FDG PET. So the epileptogenic zone is usually contained within the cortex with the most profound hypermetabolism on interictal FDG PET. So in this series of 89 patients, the sensitivity of PET in patients with refractory epilepsy and normal MRI was, was about 44%. So in half those cases where MRI is negative, um, PET will show a focal or regional metabolic abnormality. In temporal lobe epilepsy, hypermetabolism is ipsilateral to the seizure focus in somewhere between 60 and 90% of patients. And in extratemporal epilepsy, it's, uh, there's hypermetabolism in about two thirds. So this is patient number four at uh, Austin Health back in 1992. And it clearly illustrates the hypermetabolism that you may encounter in temporal lobe epilepsy um, here on the left compared to the right. So we were very excited to see this back in 1992. Oops. The hypermetabolism in the epileptic zone, it's been attributed to a number of things, including neuronal loss, diascesis, inhibitory processes, uh, reduced synaptic density and decreased blood-brain barrier glucose transporter activity. Hypermetabolism on PET more extensive than the pathologi pathological abnormality. And in temporal lobe epilepsy, the temporal hypermetabolism is associated with, may be associated with ipsilateral orbitofrontal and prefrontal cortical hypermetabolism. So you may actually see functional abnormality that extends well beyond the um, epileptic lesion. The more frequent temporal seizures are associated with a larger region of hypermetabolism. So this is a 15-year-old girl with refractory temporal lobe seizures and we have hypermetabolism here on the left. 
But in addition, she also shows hypometabolic cortex in the frontal lobe compared here on the left compared to the right. So her metabolic abnormalities are extending. Usually they extend to regions of seizure propagation. Um, PET FDG localization of the ictal focus to a lobe correlates with seizure-free surgical outcome. And concordance of two or more pre-surgical evaluation also correlates with seizure freedom. So in temporal lobe epilepsy, greater maximal asymmetry is associated with decreased chance of seizure freedom. Um, this is to remind you that um, it is also possible to capture seizures with FDG PET. Uh, often, incidentally, patients may have subclinical seizure activity or may have an event during the FDG uptake phase. And this is such a, a patient. This patient, in fact, had status epi epilepticus, which uh, is the, an opportunity, really, to be able to use FDG for localization uh, instead of um, HMPAO or ECD, instead of a perfusion agent. So she had a nictal study with FDG, which shows increased metabolic activity in the left posterior quadrant, intense uptake, and then came back at a later time for a, a true interictal study, which, which demonstrated re relative hypometabolism. So it is possible to use FDG in status epilepticus uh, as a alternate to HMPAO. Just got a couple of clinical cases just to illustrate exactly what's involved. Uh, here we have um, the interictal SPECT study. This um, is a, a, the ictal study. And on the top panel, we have the subtraction. This is a nine-year-old boy with Rasmussen's encephalitis, and he had severe seizures. This is uh, one of his seizure events. So there's intense perfusion increase in the left temporal lobe. Uh, the interictal shows relative hypoperfusion, and the subtraction clearly shows lateralization and localization to the left temporal lobe. Um, Rasmussen's is an inflammatory process, so uh, ex not unexpectedly, we're actually seeing increased metabolic act activity on his FDG PET study in the corresponding uh, left temporal cortex. Another case, this is an 18-year-old young woman with a left parietal lobe seizures. Again, interictal on the bottom panel, ictal in the mid middle panel, and subtraction. And uh, you can see that on the ictal study, there's increased blood flow, which uh, fills in an area of relative hypoperfusion on the interictal study. And uh, there it is on the subtraction. Uh, this young woman had a normal MRI, uh, but her PET clearly indicated that there was a focal cortical metabolic abnormality at the site of increased blood flow on the ictal study. Uh, this um, area correlated, was concordant with her clinical semiology, her clinical uh, localization, and she went on to have uh, surgery. And the third case, a 28-year-old woman with right temporal lobe seizures. Um, this is the FDG PET study, again registered to MRI. And um, surprisingly, she had a, a very small focus of increased metabolic activity. And the question that arises is whether this represents uh, a nictal phenomenon, so subclinical ictal activity or a, an area of um, ongoing seizure activity, or whether she may have had a, another lesion. Uh, the MRI suggested there was a structural lesion in that location. And uh, what was unusual about her ictal spec study that 
was that there was um, very little blood flow change in that right temporal lobe compared to the interrectal. So this is not a typical pattern for a temporal lobe seizure. And it did raise suspicion that that uh, focal activity on the FDG PET study posteriorly was the uh, cause of her seizures. She went on and had surgery, and the lesion proved to be a pleomorphic um, xanthoastrocytoma. So the comprehensive epilepsy program consists of clinical neuroimaging and out outcome. Um, the neuroimaging, you've heard about uh, MRI and ictal and SPECT and PET. Um, what you haven't heard is that this process of generating a, a hypothesis about the localization of the patient's seizures is a, an iterative process and it um, occurs at the CEP meeting. So there are new hypotheses that are generated at the meeting based on the patient's um, clinical data and imaging data, and then they're tested again um, against uh, and, and against the hypothesis. So it's very much a, a working meeting where we um, have all the imaging data, we perform the registrations with the functional imaging and the subtraction at the meeting in real time and generate new hypotheses. Um, and then the patients that go on, those that are offered surgery, uh, will get a, a letter of offer and um, proceed to surgery. Thank you.